Um, so tonight we're doing our last of the three sessions on the end times, and tonight we're going to focus on purgatory. Um, but let's start off with a prayer. Let's start with a prayer to St. Michael. Um, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And then today is an optional feast for St. Louis, so St. Louis, pray for us. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about purgatory, but I want to start off with. Oops, let me get this situation. A little touchy. All right, let's see. So we're going to first do some common misconceptions. I'm going to correct some common misconceptions you may have. Whoops. This thing's a little touchy. All right. So first, you cannot get warts from touching a toad. That's a misconception. So warts are from viruses that are unique to humans. So you're not going to get warts from touching a toad. You can't get arthritis from cracking your knuckles. Waking up a sleepwalker doesn't harm them. It may make the, they may wake up a little confused at first, but you're not doing them harm. When you get a wound or a cut or an abrasion, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide is actually not effective to decrease the risk of an infection. It actually can actually impede healing and it can lead to problems. So you may want to, if you put it on maybe initially, but don't keep putting it on. I see that often in clinic. A lot of people do that, but it actually isn't effective in decreasing infections. So that's a common misconception. Another common misconception is that the blood in a vein is blue. It's not blue. Sometimes in pictures they depict it to be able to distinguish the arteries and veins, but it's a deep red, it, just like the, the blood is still red, whether it's in the artery or in the vein. Slightly different shades of red, but still red. Another misconception is that uh, antibiotics, they are actually useless for the common cold. The common cold is a virus. And then the last misconception is that if you eat less than an hour before swimming, it's going to increase your risk of drowning. This is false. Eating has no relationship with drowning. There's other things that probably go into that, but not eating. So those are some common misconceptions you hear kind of day in, day out. Um, and then the, the next one we're going to spend all our time tonight on, purgatory. Purgatory is another issue. It has a lot of common misconceptions by Catholics and non-Catholics. So hopefully by the end of the night we can clear up a lot of the things that people say and believe and think about purgatory. So one of the things I want to start off by saying is things that purgatory is not. Purgatory is not a place for the damned. People who are condemned to hell go to hell. They don't go to purgatory. Purgatory is not a second chance for sinners to be saved. If someone dies and is condemned to hell, they go to hell. As I said, they're not going to go to purgatory for a second chance. Purgatory is not unbiblical. There are actually many examples in scripture that we'll show tonight of where you can get the idea, the teaching of purgatory. Now the word purgatory is not in the Bible, but the word trinity, the word incarnation, those aren't in the Bible either, but the teachings are there. And so you'll see that purgatory, the teaching is in scripture. Purgatory is not an invention of the Catholic Church. This idea of purification after death and the afterlife even is a tradition of the Jewish people. Um, it's not just a Catholic thing, but it has been believed by the Catholic Church for 2,000 years. And it hasn't changed and it won't change. Purgatory is not the church saying that God is vengeful. It's actually a sign of God's love and mercy as well as justice. Purgatory is not an offense against God's grace. And so those are the common things that purgatory is not. And so as we go on throughout the night, I'll explain some of these in more detail, and we'll explain what purgatory is. Now, before we get started, though, there are a few things we have to first understand, and I'm going to spend actually a little bit of time setting the foundation. Because if our foundation isn't very strong with certain teachings and understandings, we're not going to grasp pur purgatory. So the first thing to understand is our eternal destiny. And we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But every person is destined to spend eternity in either heaven or hell eternally. Every, everyone will be in one of those two places. 
And so the question is, how do we get to heaven? That's our goal for everybody. Everyone wants to be in heaven, be with God. And so how do we get to heaven? It's important to understand these five things in order to understand purgatory. What do we mean by salvation? What do we mean by grace? What do we mean by sin, faith, and good works? And this is how come purgatory is a difficult thing for non-Catholics to understand because they often disagree with Catholics in these areas. And so if they already don't agree with these foundational things, they're going to have a hard time understanding what purgatory is and why it's necessary and why it's a sign of God's love and mercy. But these things are foundational. It's kind of like if you are wanting to learn algebra, you can't start at algebra. You have to learn addition, subtraction, multiplication. You have to learn those things first. And so this, that's kind of analogous to this. We have to make sure we understand what these concepts mean. And so I'm going to spend the first little bit talking about these to make sure everyone understands these terms and to make sure when you're talking to other Catholics or non-Catholics, you may have to find out where they view these topics before proceeding, proceeding on to purgatory. So the first one, salvation. And now each of these five things could be a talk in itself. So we're only going to spend a little bit, a slide or two on all of these. We'll spend a little bit more time on sin, but just a slide or two just to give you a, a grasp of the concepts. So final salvation, what does that mean? Final salvation means being in heaven, being in the beatific vision with God. It means that at death, when you die, you're in a state of grace. That means you're in the right relationship with God. You have sanctifying grace in your soul. You've cooperated with God's grace and persevered throughout your life. Anyone with unrepentant mortal sin and death will not be in heaven. They'll be in hell. And so again, purgatory and heaven aren't for this group. So in order to be in heaven, you have to have no unrepentant mortal sins on your soul. You must have sanctifying grace. Sacred scripture and sacred tradition tell us, and if someone asks me what do Catholics believe about how we're saved, I'll say this. We're saved by the grace of God alone, and this grace was made available to all men through Christ. And then by cooperating with this gift of grace, we can achieve the salvation that God desires through our perseverance and faith and works. Faith and works are fruits of our cooperation with grace. If you're cooperating with this grace, you'll have faith and works. And so grace, sanctifying grace, and those are the catechism references if you want to read more, but basically sanctifying grace is a free gift from God. It's undeserved. It's not something we deserve. It's something God freely offers all men. This grace, the sanctifying grace, helps us to respond to God's call to be His children. It's, it's a supernatural power infused within us. You kind of think about all the different superheroes and they all have their supernatural, their, their supernatural powers. This is ours. Grace is our supernatural power. It's what we need in our soul to help us get to heaven, to rise above any of our natural abilities. Sanctifying grace is this participation in the life of God. It's what makes us holy and truly makes us holy. We're not just covered and then on the inside we're not holy and we just appear to be. We truly are holy from the inside out by grace. And grace is necessary in order to have faith and do good works. We must have grace. Now if someone can do good things naturally, someone can be kind, someone can be, um, do charitable works, but it's not going to be something that will help them have a supernatural love and supernatural charity that will get them to heaven unless they have sanctifying grace in their soul. And so you must have this in your soul to enter heaven and that's a key thing uh, to remember is the sanctifying grace must be present in our soul to enter heaven. Now this is initially received at baptism and then you can also receive it in other sacraments, confession and the Eucharist. Now, sanctifying grace is something that can be lost, and we'll talk about that. But if, if you lose it in mortal sin, confession, you can regain it. If you have sanctifying grace in your soul, you can increase it through different things, participating in the sacraments, through prayer, through corporal works of mercy, and other things. You can increase that grace within your soul. Oops. So faith and good works. So what is faith? Faith is a free gift from God as well. It's one, of the, it's one of the theological virtues. It's a supernatural virtue infused by God. And you must have grace to have true faith. Faith that is fruitful. Faith that will help us get to heaven. And faith is necessary for salvation along with good works. 
Faith and good works go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Because if you're cooperating with grace, both faith and good works will be the fruit. And James chapter 2 talks all about this. It says you can't have faith without works. It's like a body without a soul. You must have, a like a body must have a soul to be alive, faith must have good works in order to be fruitful and alive. And faith is our personal adherence to God. So we freely submit our entire being to God, our intellect, our will. We're completely submitted to God. That's faith. St. Paul uses the term obedience of faith because it's not just an intellectual, intellectual assent saying, I believe in Jesus or I believe in God. It's an obedience that goes along with that faith. That all the God's truths, all the truths God has revealed to us, we obey them, we understand them, we listen to His church, we listen to, the, to Scripture, and we obey all that God has revealed to us. And so we're freely assenting to the whole truth. We're not picking and choosing the things we like or the things that are easy. Everything God's revealed, we're assenting to that. So that's faith. Now, good works, all men are called to holiness. And so in Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, we're going to refer to this passage again later, but all men are called to be perfect. And Jesus says, you're called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And so the fullness of Christian life is this perfection of charity. So good works are things that to help us to be holy. And so good works include a variety of things. Having faith itself is a good work. Loving God, loving our neighbor, obedience to God, they're all considered good works. And no work can be done for God without grace. And so scripture, where does scripture talk to us about good works? So scripture tells us, Jesus himself, in John chapter 6, verse 29, he says that the work of God is believing. So he even tells us that faith itself is a work. And then elsewhere in scripture you can see where Jesus tells us things that are necessary for eternal life. And so these would be considered works, in a sense. So baptism, repentance, keeping the commandments, professing our faith, sharing our faith, evangelizing. And there's a phrase, we're coming to the knowledge of truth. This idea of growing in our knowledge of God and the faith. Loving God and loving my neighbor. And then we can go on and on. There's even more things throughout Scripture that show us examples of what a good work is. And so these are things that if we cooperate with grace, these are the fruits of that. And so faith and works, cooperating with that grace is essential to get to heaven. So can we have sanctifying grace in our soul and be on the path towards heaven and then fall away and lose that grace? Or is once, once we accept Christ, we're saved and we can never lose that salvation? Now sometimes there are some non-Catholics who believe this idea of once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you say have faith in Christ, that's it. From here on out, you'll be in heaven no matter what you do. So is that what Scripture says? Can we lose our salvation? Scripture says, yes, you can lose your salvation. You can have sanctifying grace in your soul and then fall away. You can have faith, you can be believing, you can be cooperating with grace, you can be baptized, but then you can fall away. And particularly, a particular example is mortal sin. And we'll talk about mortal sin, but it's turning away from God. And if we turn away from God and reject God, we will lose this grace within our soul. And so if that happens, we must recognize it, repent, and be reconciled to God. Otherwise, we'll remain in this state of rejection. We'll remain in this state without grace in our soul. And here are just a few scripture passages. There's tons for this topic. The idea that we can lose our salvation is everywhere in scripture. But here's just a few. St. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. May you fight a good fight by having faith and a good conscience. Some, by rejecting conscience, have made a shipwreck of their faith. So they're on the right ship, they're on their path, on their way to heaven, but then they don't listen to what they know to be right or wrong, and they're making a shipwreck of their faith. They're making a mess of it. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore, whoever thinks he is standing secure should take care not to fall. The idea of falling away from the faith. Mark 13, verse 13, The one who perseveres until the end will be saved. So we must persevere in this grace. We must maintain this grace in our soul. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, 
Therefore, beloved, and this is St. Peter writing, since you are forewarned, be on your guard not to be led into the error of the unprincipled, or some say the wicked, and to fall from your own stability. It's this idea of being led astray and falling away from the faith. And I could go on and on. It's throughout Scripture, and so it's an imp it's important, important concept to be aware of. So when we're going to talk about purgatory in a minute, we must understand we can lose our salvation and lose this grace. So what Scripture tells us is that we can lose that grace. So every day we must pick up our cross and follow Christ. Every day have this daily conversion. We must believe and obey God every day. If we do fall away, and if we fall into sin, we must repent and turn back to God. A perfect example is like the prodigal son. He rejects his father, leaves the family. Um, he goes and spends his inheritance, squanders it, and then over time he realizes the sinfulness and, and the, the wrongness in his actions and he goes back to the Father and repents and the Father welcomes him back and that's what God will do for us as well. Now if a person dies without sanctifying grace in their soul they will be in hell forever, eternally. And that's why it's so important to be aware of this concept. The Catechism and Scripture and everywhere you look tells us now is the time of grace. Now is the time it's being offered and so now is the time to accept that grace and cooperate with that grace. We talked about this last week some. But God has given us our earthly lives to choose to love Him, to repent, to experience conversion, to persevere in faith and good works, and then to regain that grace if we lose it. And so after we die, we do not have that time any longer. So now sin. I'm going to spend the next few minutes on sin because this is another very, very important concept to understand in order to move on with purgatory. So sin. And those are the catechism references, but what is sin? Sin is an offense against God. It's freely choosing to turn away from God, to go against God's will, to go against God's love. And so it's a failure in genuine love for God and for neighbor. And sin, no matter what type of sin, it dishonors God. And it always causes some degree of alienation and some degree of injury to our relationship with God when we sin. And so due to justice, punishment is a result. And we're going to come back and talk about that. Now the Catechism and, and the Church Sacred Tradition as well as Scripture tells us there's two types of sin. And we refer to those as mortal sin and venial sin. And I'm not going to spend time on this, but there are some scripture passages that can refer to that, but um, we're going to distinguish between these two. So mortal sin. The word mortal means deadly. So if someone sustains like a mortal wound, it's a deadly wound. Their life is threatened and at risk. Well, with a mortal sin, it's deadly. It destroys our relationship with God and man. So it destroys charity in the heart. It's completely opposed to God's love. And so this idea of charity, so charity is this sense of loving God above all things and loving my neighbor because they're a child of God. If someone has mortal sin in their soul, it doesn't mean they can't be a nice person or do kind things. They still could, but it's going to be on a natural level. It's not going to be on a supernatural level. That charity that puts God above all things and puts um, love's neighbor for God's sake is destroyed. It's no longer existing in the soul as long as mortal sin is present. Because mortal sin in and of itself tells us we've chosen something and put it in front of God. We've gone against God's will and God's love. Mortal sin, we, have, we completely lose sanctifying grace in our soul with any one mortal sin. And mortal sin is a grave violation of God's law. And so if someone commits a mortal sin, they must go to the sacrament of confession to be able to restore that sanctifying grace back into their soul. And with mortal sin, it's man completely turning away from God, completely rejecting God. Now, venial sin. These are called, quote, lesser sins. Our relationship between God and man is still wounded. And so charity is wounded, but it's not destroyed. So charity still subsists in the heart, so it's not destroyed, but it is weakened, it is injured. Sanctifying grace remains in the soul. 
And these sins aren't deadly like a mortal sin, but they still weaken us. They still have an effect on us. And so they're things that we cannot just simply dismiss and ignore. And the church warns us and says, do not simply just dismiss these sins. Even though they're considered, quote, lesser, they still wound us. St. Augustine used the analogy that if you have a large quantity of small drops of water, it still can fill a river. And so just like with these venial sins, if we have a lot of them on our soul, they're still doing harm and damage. And with venial sins, even though they're not grave like a mortal sin, they still make us more prone to commit more and more venial sins. They make us more um, likely to commit even a mortal sin. So they still are affecting our soul, so we can't dismiss them. So if we have a, a venial sin on our soul, we can either pray to God and ask for forgiveness through prayer, but we must be sorry, must repent, and confess our sins either to God through prayer, or you still can confess them in, in, in the sacrament of confession as well. And we're encouraged to do that because the sacrament does give us grace. And so even though we don't lose sanctifying grace with a venial sin, that sacrament can increase that grace that's in our soul. Now for a mortal sin, three things must be met. It must be grave matter, so it involves something serious, something grave. It's committed with full knowledge, which means you know that it's serious. And then deliberate consent. So it's serious, you know it's serious, and you do it anyway. That would make it, that would qualify it for a mortal sin. So a few examples. So one example would be missing Mass on Sundays or Holy Days of Obligation. So that's a mortal sin. So if you know that it's serious and it's a mortal sin, and you do it anyway without serious reason for missing, then that's a mortal sin. Now, if you didn't know that before I said that tonight, it's still a sin. It still would have been a venial sin, but you wouldn't have, been, you wouldn't have met all three criteria if you did not know that it was a grave and serious matter. But now that you know, from here on out, it would be a mortal sin. So a mortal sin is, so missing Mass on Sunday without a serious reason is, is serious. If you know it's serious and you do it anyway, that would be a mortal sin. Other examples would be adultery, um, participating in abortion in some way. Um, they all involve serious matter, and I'll talk more about mortal sin here in just a minute. But every mortal sin is an infinite evil against God. It's an infinite offense against God. And so one single mortal sin so deeply wounds the divine heart of Jesus to a degree that we cannot even imagine. And so that's why they're just very, very serious. We're deliberately rejecting God and what He has told us um, to be His will and to be His way. And so if you're not sure you want to know is something a mortal sin or not, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this talk. It's, it can be a whole talk for another day. But you can look to Scripture and you can look to ch the church. You can look to the catechism. You can talk to priests in the confessional about it. But just some guidelines would be looking at Scripture. So the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes. If you do something that goes against the Ten Commandments, it's likely it's probably some type of mortal sin or some type of serious grave issue. Um, and so the Ten Commandments, you have murder and stealing, um, adultery, missing mass. Um, and so lying sometimes potentially could be a mortal sin, depending on the situation. Um, now, they're all sins no matter what. So lying is a sin. It just depends on the circumstances as to the degree if it's mortal or not. So that would be one example that you could look to. Another is St. Paul. He gives us a list, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And he goes to list things that if you're living in these sins, you will not go to heaven. He says, neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now it means if you are living in these um, sinful acts and performing these sinful acts and you're not repentant and you die without being repentant, then these are things that could keep you out of heaven. And so those are, so you can look elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, John in the book of Revelation lists some other things similar to this list. But you can look to Scripture, to the catechism, and talk to a priest to help you to be able to discern the different degrees of sin. But sin is important to recognize. And as soon as we sin, we need to be repentant because we're rejecting God in some way. Whether it's a mortal sin or a venial sin, we're still a, a injuring our relationship with God to some degree. And what we're doing when we sin, and a lot of times we don't think of it in this way, but I think it is important that we do. But what we're doing is we've acknowledged God. God is our creator. God loves us. 
He loves us unconditionally to the point He sent Christ on earth to die for us. He gives us the gift of grace. He freely offers us salvation. So we're acknowledging that. Then we also acknowledge Satan. He's evil. He's opposed to all that is good. He has nothing but contempt for God. So we are, we are acknowledging these two things exist. And then what's happening is when we're tempted, whether it's by unchastity or lust or envy, unrighteous anger, pride, we're choosing Satan over God. We're choosing to reject God and choosing evil. We're choosing to turn away from the good to the evil freely. And so every time we sin, we're doing this to some degree. And as a result of sin, because of what we're choosing to do, there's two things that result from it. Guilt and punishment. And this is when purgatory is going to come really into play with this concept, is guilt and punishment. So with every sin, mortal and venial, there's guilt and punishment. Sin has consequences. God created man for himself. God created us out of love to love him in return. Now he loves us enough he gave us free will so we can choose to love him or choose to reject him. But if we choose to reject him and sin, there's still consequences. And so I, I like the uh, comparison of a campfire. So if you have a campfire and you have this big fire burning, you have the choice, the free choice, to either stick your hand in that fire or not. If you stick your hand in that fire, you will be burned. It will be painful. And so just like a relationship with God, we still have this free choice to love Him or reject Him. But if we reject Him, there's consequences because God made us for Himself. And so if we reject what we're made for, there's consequences. And so we will get burned. It'll be painful, just like sticking your hand in that fire. There's consequences. And then there's guilt and then punishment. And there's two types of punishment, eternal and temporal. So guilt, this guilt, every time we sin, mortal or venial, this guilt clings to our soul. And this guilt is there because it's an offense against God and we recognize that. We recognize we're offending God in some way and offending His love in some way, whether mortal or venial. And this guilt can be washed away, and Scripture tells us that in, in many places. But this guilt can be washed away when we confess. And so if it's a mortal sin, we need to go to the sacrament of confession. If it's a venial sin, we can either go to the sacrament or just confess to God in prayer. But this guilt can be washed away through confession. Now the punishment that's due. Scripture tells us in many instances that punishment is due for our sins out of justice. No matter how small they seem, punishment will result. Eternal punishment is hell. And Scripture speaks of hell. It's everlasting, eternal. It's something for those who die in a state of unrepentant mortal sin. Now hell, this eternal punishment, is only due for mortal sin. It's not the consequence of venial sin, only mortal sin. This can be removed in confession, in the sacrament of confession. You can have the guilt as well as the eternal punishment removed. Now temporal punishments... Those are punishments both to mortal and venial sin. We can see this throughout Scripture, some examples to give you an idea of where Scripture shows us some examples of punishment. King David. If you remember King David, he had an affair with Bathsheba, and he um, committed adultery, and he went and had her husband, um, Uriah, killed as well. So murder and adultery. And so he also, whenever, during this act of adultery, he got Bathsheba pregnant. Well, one day Nathan the prophet comes to David and he's speaking for God and he helps David to recognize his sinfulness. David already knew what he had done was wrong and, and Nathan is bringing that to the surface to show him how he's offended God. And so David tells Nathan that he's very sorry, he's offended God. And so Nathan tells him, you are forgiven. God forgives you. But there's still consequences. He tells David, you will not die. And I take that to mean the eternal punishment of hell, you will not die, and God forgives your sins. He forgave the guilt, but, but your baby that Bathsheba's carrying will still die. And so this is a, a form of punishment that David received, a form of temporal punishment David received. If you think about Moses, Moses, towards the end of his life, right before they entered the Promised Land, didn't listen to God and, in a sense, disobeyed God, and so he wasn't allowed to enter the Promised Land because of this. So that's a form of temporal punishment. 
And then Mary, also called Miriam, the sister of Moses, there's an episode where she also disobeys God, um, but she was forgiven, but she still had to suffer with leprosy and had seven days of exile. So there's still, throughout Scripture, we see temporal punishment. And I can go on and on, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Just wanted to give you at least a sense for temporal punishment. And temporal punishment is not vengeful retribution from God. It's because of justice. Punishment is due to sin. When we reject God, this is the consequence. When we stick our hand in fire, we're having pain and we're getting burned. Not because it's vengeful, it's because that's the consequence of us sticking our hand in fire. And it's disciplining us too. It's a good thing that fire is painful and burns us. It teaches us not to keep doing it. So similarly with sin. Sin, this punishment that's associated with it, is to help train us and discipline us so that we do not continue to sin and continue to reject God. And so these just stem from the nature of sin itself. As I mentioned, we are made for God. So anytime we choose to reject Him, there's consequences. And I'm going to quote Hebrews chapter 12 here in a little while, but Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 to 14, clearly shows us that God is our Father in heaven. And he says that just like your earthly fathers who discipline you because they want you to be virtuous, they want you to be holy, God the Father also disciplines us and He will punish us when necessary. And even though this discipline will be painful, over time it will make us holy. And so these temporal punishments are a form of discipline. And so the chap Hebrews chapter 12 says, Discipline, though painful, will produce righteousness and holiness. And holiness is required to enter heaven. So these temporal punishments are, are necessary. And the Catechism talks about this as well. It says absolution or forgiveness of our sin, doesn't, it does take away the guilt and it will take away the eternal punishment, but it does not remedy all the disorders that sin has caused. And so it, the Catechism tells us the sinner must recover his full spiritual health. So sin causes blemishes, causes defilements, causes issues in our soul that must be restored to full health. And these are considered the temporal punishments. And these temporal punishments can be remitted, can be removed through penance. And penance can be a variety of things. Um, sometimes the priest will give you, usually the priest will give you some form of penance after the sacrament of confession, but you can impose them on yourself as well. If you've known you've committed some venial sins and you're not going to the sacrament necessarily, you can impose them on yourself. Um, so we need to do penance for all the different temporal punishments associated with all the sins we've committed in our life. So prayer, works of mercy, doing some type of voluntary work, charitable work, making some type of self-denial or sacrifice, such as fasting, um, almsgiving, and then just any time we're suffering, patiently bearing that, bearing that suffering and offering it up. Those can be examples of penance. So as I mentioned, sin comes with guilt and punishment. So if we go to confession, the guilt can be forgiven. The eternal punishment can be remitted if it's a mortal sin through the sacrament of confession. And then temporal punishments can still remain and require penance. So again, that example of King David, just to remind you. And, and we can also even think, just more practically speaking, in our, in our own lives. If you have a son or a daughter or a brother or sister, let's say the rule in the house is you cannot throw the ball in the house. But your son throws the ball anyway and he ends up breaking a window. Well, what's going to end up happening is he's going to need to be punished. Number one, he's going to have to pay for that window. And number two, he's going to have to do something for breaking the rule of throwing the ball in the house. And so that act of disobeying you as well as breaking the window require consequences and require some form of punishment. And he'll need to do penance in a sense. He needs to maybe do some extra chores to pay for the window and then do some extra chores just because he broke the rules. And so just like our earthly fathers, God the Father does something similar with the temporal punishments associated with sin. So our eternal destinies, so man is either going to eternally be in heaven or eternally be in hell. So in order to enter heaven, you must die with sanctifying grace in your soul. You must be perfect. You must be holy. And you, and, and you must be perfect and holy as God is perfect and holy. No imperfections. And then those who enter heaven must be united to God. And they must have chosen to love God in their earthly lives. Those who go to hell are those who die without sanctifying grace in their soul. 
They have chosen in some way to reject God. They have separated themselves from God. They die with unrepentant mortal soul, mortal sin on their soul. So those are our two destinies. So where does purgatory fit in? So again, just to emphasize, Scripture tells us that in order to get to heaven and to be in the presence of God, we must be perfect. We must be purified. We must be clean. We must be holy. And these are all terms taken from Scripture. And we must be pure of heart. Here's a few examples in Scripture where it shows us that. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. Nothing unclean can enter into the presence of God. And this word unclean comes from a Greek word that's referring to spiritual corruption. So you can't have any defilements or blemishes on your soul. You cannot be unclean. Matthew 5, verse 8. Those to see God must be pure of heart. Whoever comes into the presence of God must be perfectly pure. And this is a reference to Habakkuk 1, verse 13. And it says, because God's eyes are too pure to behold evil. So, because of God's mercy, those who die in a state of grace, that means they have sanctifying grace in their soul, their destiny is heaven. If they are not yet perfect, and not yet completely purified, and not yet fully holy, they will experience purgatory. And this is because of God's love and mercy. Because justice still requires that these sinful things, these temporal punishments, be paid and be remitted. And so because of God's mercy, He, he gives us the gift of purgatory. And so someone who is destined for heaven, but needs to be purified, needs to be refined and pu uh, perfected, will experience purgatory. And so just to reiterate, so what makes someone imperfect, not fully purified, not completely holy and pure, but have sanctifying grace in their soul? So venial sins, and then the effects of sin on the soul, these temporal punishments I've been referring to, that, ha that are due to our sins, but have not yet been fully satisfied. They haven't fully been paid for yet in our earthly lives. Now we have a chance in our earthly lives to do penance, and to offer up different sufferings for these temporal punishments, but if at the moment of our death we aren't yet perfectly pure, perfectly holy, and still have these blemishes on our soul, then purgatory is a necessity, as long as we're in a right relationship with God when we die. Purgatory is necessary so we can be prepared to enter heaven. And so the Catechism um, talks about purgatory and says that, and these are some things we must emphasize, that one who dies with sanctifying grace in their soul but who is not yet perfect and not yet perfectly purified. So this group is already assured heaven, but they cannot enter it yet because their soul is not yet ready. So they must be purified and must achieve holiness that's required to enter the joys of heaven. And so that's what purgatory does. Now the word purgatory comes from the Latin word purgare, which means to make clean, to purify. And so the Catechism also tells us there's three essential components of purgatory. There's some type of purification after death. It involves some type of pain and suffering. And that this purification can be assisted by our prayers and things we can offer up for those souls in purgatory. And so this is really the extent the details that we know. There's a lot of other questions that we, the details aren't really known. The church fathers have made some speculations, but these are the things we do know. Purification after death, it's some type of painful experience, and our prayers here on earth can assist those in purgatory. Now here's some analogies that may be helpful for, for you to kind of understand. So the first one would be the idea of, I have a house and I have children, and they've been outside playing in the mud, and they're just getting, they haven't done anything wrong, I didn't, they didn't break any rules, but they've gotten really muddy and dirty. So they come in to enter the house, and before they can enter, then on the porch, I'm going to hose them down with, with a water hose, or make sure they're cleaning themselves off with the doormat or the towel or whatever, before they can enter my house. It's this idea of being cleansed. They're still my child, they haven't done anything that's rejecting 
being my, my ch one of my children, and they enter the, they have to be cleansed before they enter. The one I like even better is this idea of nail and wood. So if you can imagine taking a piece of wood and a hammer and a nail, you nail in the hammer into the wood. Get a whole lot of nails, nail them in. That's sin. The nail represents sin. So you've nailed in all these different nails into the wood. As you remove these nails through confession, there's still holes that remain in that wood because that has an effect, that has a consequence. And so what we have to do is fill in all those holes to make that piece of wood perfectly pure again. So some of that can be filled in on earth through penances, but if we're not perfect when we die, then we must be perfected through purgatory. Now one of the things we can also kind of use to think about purgatory is in terms of refining. And so purgatory is a process of refining and it's completing whatever hasn't been perfected on earth. And so scripture gives us a lot of examples of, the, of this idea. So in Malachi chapter 3 verse 3, this is in the Old Testament, it says he, and it's referring to, to Messiah, Jesus, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 10, many shall be refined, purified, and tested, but the wicked shall prove wicked. Wisdom chapter 3 verses 5 to 6, chastised, which also can be translated as dis disciplined, a little, they shall be greatly blessed because God tried them or tested them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them and he took them to himself. And so we're being refined, we're being purified, just like gold in a furnace. In Sirach chapter 2 verse 5, for in the fire gold is tested. In Zechariah chapter 13 verses 8 to 9, I will bring the one-third through fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. They shall call upon my name, and I will hear them. I will say they are my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. It's this idea of God testing and refining and purifying his people. And that can refer again to on earth or even in, in purgatory, in the afterlife, to be refined and perfected like gold and silver. Even in the New Testament we see this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6-7, to 7, Peter writes, You may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your love, more precious than gold, that is perishable even though tested by fire. So again, this idea of testing and having our faith and our love for God tested through fire. Revelation chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. It's, it refers to this idea that Jesus wants us to be gold refined by fire so that we can put on the white garments. So this idea of white garments, this idea of being saved, being pure. So in order to put on the white garments and be pure, we must be gold refined by fire. We must be cleansed and purged of anything impure. Now this refining and purifying can also be known by the word sanctification. Sanctification means being made holy. So we can also understand it as purifying, being refined. And so it can start in our earthly life, but if we're not completely perfected when we die, completely purified when we die, then purgatory is necessary. Now if you've ever heard of a silversmith, um, a silversmith is someone who's going to purify silver. And you may hear of a goldsmith or other types of metal um, workers who are purifying the metal. And so when a silversmith is trying to purify silver, he'll put it under intense heat. And then he'll heat it until the impurities rise to the surface. That's called the dross. But it rises to the surface, then he removes it from the heat, scrapes off the impurities, puts it back in. Intense heat gets the impurities to come up scrapes them off, puts it back in, and he'll continue this process of applying intense heat to get the impurities to rise to the surface. And he'll keep scraping them off. And so the question is, well, how does the silversmith know when the silver is perfectly pure? Well, it's whenever he can see his reflection in it. And so it's just like us with our lives here on earth and in purgatory is that we need this refining, this purifying, and God will continue to test us by fire, whether in this life or the next, until we're perfectly pure. And when are we perfectly pure? When God can perfectly see his reflection in us. And that's when we're ready to enter heaven. 
And so this idea of refining and purifying is necessary to enter heaven. And purgatory does that. Now purgatory is something that we know does involve suffering. And scripture sometimes refers to this as a cleansing fire. The catechism and, and the church fathers refer to this as a cleansing fire. But the church does teach that it's different than the fires and the pains and the suffering of those in hell, but it's still very, very painful. It is a painful experience. And so why is there suffering? Well, the answer to this is why is there suffering in this life as well as why is there suffering in purgatory? Because scripture tells us suffering produces righteousness and holiness and sanctification. In purgatory, we're going to have a sense of joy because we know that we're assured heaven. We know that God awaits us. So there is this joy that's present, but there is also suffering and pain. And there's, this is experienced for two primary reasons. From one, because we're separated from God. We have this intense desire, almost like a magnet drawing us to heaven. We've now died, and we now know that heaven is our destiny and heaven's our goal. And we were just drawn to it intensely, but we can't be there yet. So the separation from God and not yet being in heaven is experienced as, as a sense of pain. Because we don't want to delay being and experiencing this eternal happiness that awaits us in heaven. So we don't want to be delayed. And so this, suff this does bring some suffering to the soul in purgatory, the separation from God. We know we'll be there, so there's still some joy, but that we're still separated. We also know there is some joy because we know that what's happening is for our own good and is guided by God's providence and that He's doing this to prepare us to be ready for heaven. So that's, that brings some joy. We can suffer joyfully in a sense, but there's still pain from this. And then the second is pains of fire. Now there's debate in the church, among the church fathers, as to whether or not this is metaphorical, like a metaphor, metaphorical sense of fire, or if it's a real material fire. And if you read the Church Fathers, there's different opinions about that. A large number of the Church Fathers in the West believe it's some type of real material fire. Now, how a soul whose only spirit can experience this, the Church Fathers say we don't know, but some Church Fathers do say it's a real material fire. But there's others who also say, no, it's just metaphorical. Either way, the Church really hasn't spoken and said one way or the other, so you're free to believe either. But either way... This pains of fire is referring to this intense pain. It'll pierce the soul to the quick. It'll purify all the defects that we can possibly deceive, possibly conceive. Um, this pain in purgatory, most of the church fathers say, it'll be worse than anything we've experienced on earth. One of the things about earth is when we are suffering, it's oftentimes intermittent. If we have a headache, it may come and go. Or we can take medicine for it. Or we could fall asleep to help ease some of the suffering and pain. Or we can be distracted. We can read a book or watch TV and a fever or a headache or stomach pains can maybe be minimized. But in purgatory, there's not going to be this intermittent nature to the pain. It's going to be constant. So this idea of constant pain is going to, in a sense, make the pain more, more uh, severe than what we've faced on earth. But most of the church fathers say that even beyond this, the pain will be more intense than anything we've suffered here on earth. In purgatory, the souls are happy and unhappy at the same time. So they're going to be amidst tribulation, anxiety, anguish. They're, they're going to recognize all the degrees of evil they've committed in their life um, that offended God in some way. Everything that we considered light and unimportant, we're going to see come into light of things that we did that offended God. But again, at the same time, we'll still have this consolation because we know that heaven awaits us and that we've been given this eternal crown that's awaiting us after this purgation. St. Thomas Aquinas says that he just speculates. He thinks that this fire, this experience of pain, will become less and less intense as we're becoming more and more purified. But that's speculation from, on his part. But in purgatory, we, there is joy, um, but there is torment at the same time. So pain and suffering is definitely there, as well as a sense of joy. And so here's just a list of a few of the church fathers who do teach in a real material fire. So St. Augustine, Gregory the Great, Bonaventure, Thomas Aquinas, and many others. 
Uh, but again, you're free to believe whether it's a material fire or a metaphorical fire. Either way, it definitely is a painful experience. It's something that we want to avoid if we can. And we'll talk about that. And so this idea again of suffering. Why is suffering so necessary? And here's the passage from Hebrews, chap Hebrews chapter 6, I'm mean, sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 to 11 that I referred to earlier. I'm going to read this portion because it's very important. And so it says, For the Lord disciplines whom he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? He, referring to God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And this is verse 14. Strive for peace with all men, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So again, it shows us this discipline is out of love, and this discipline is to help us become holy. And this holiness is required to enter heaven. So in order to see the Lord, we must be holy. So this discipline, this punishment, this suffering is for our own, for our own good. So we can be holy and enter heaven. And so suffering produces this holiness and righteousness, whether here on earth or in purgatory. And as I mentioned, sanctification is a term that means being made holy, being made perfect, being made pure. Sanctification is possible because of Christ. So everything we're talking about tonight is not saying that, oh, what Christ did on the cross was not, cross was not good enough. Absolutely incorrect. Sanctification is possible only because of Christ. Christ's act on the cross redeemed all men, which means it restored the relationship between God and humanity. And then Christ's act on the cross made salvation possible for all men. He offered grace to all men. And then He gives us the free will to choose to cooperate with, cooperate with that grace or not. And if we cooperate with grace, then we will begin this process of, process of sanctification here on earth. And then when we die, if that sanctification process hasn't yet made us perfect, then we'll experience purgatory. Sanctification and suffering are not optional. They're essential in order for us to be perfected and purified so we can enter heaven. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. He's not just saying, may he just cover you so that you appear to be holy. Your entire being is to be sanctified and made holy. And then Paul continues, And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord. So again, Paul is referring to this promise that God will make us holy if we continue to cooperate with His grace. And purgatory is the fulfillment of a promise. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5, verses 28, Jesus says, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, through purgatory... If after this earthly life we're not already perf perfect, purgatory will fulfill this promise. It will make us perfect. Monsignor Charles Pope is, is a, a priest and he writes, has a blog. And so I found something on one of his blogs about purgatory and it was really, really good. I just have to quote it here. But Monsignor Charles Pope writes, St. Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, May God, who has begun a good work in you, bring it to completion. And then he goes on, Well, if I were to die today, Jesus would need to complete a work that he has begun in me. By God's grace, I have come a mighty long way, but I have a long way to go. God is very holy, and his perfection is beyond imagining. And I know I myself feel this way, and I'm sure many of you do, that I've come a long way with God's grace, but I have a long way to go. And if I were to die today, I would need this merciful gift of, this, of purgatory in order for me to be made perfect. Anytime we sin, we, we build up blemishes and defilements in our soul. Um, we cling to worldly things in this life. We, we're attached to sinful things. We're attached to pleasures and emotions that don't lead us towards God, but lead us away from God. We carry with us hurts and sorrow and regret and disappointments. We can't take any of this with us to heaven. 
in the book of Revelation, Jesus says that um, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. This is Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So if this is to be fulfilled, then he would need to wipe away all these things we carry with us when we die. He would need to purify us from all these worldly attachments, from all these disappointments and hurts and sorrows that we have, these regrets that we have. And so in purgatory, we must pass through fire so that we can be purified from, from all these things, so that all these worldly things can be burned away. Job says um, in Job chapter 23, verse 10, But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as pure gold. Yes, gold. Pure gold. Perfect gold. So purgatory has to be a reality if these things are to be fulfilled. If I'm going to be made pure and perfect like gold, Purgatory is a necessity. Now I'm going to spend a little bit um, of the last portion of this talk with Scripture. So this is going to be where a lot of non-Catholics want evidence. I want to see where this is found in Scripture. I've already given you some examples of where Scripture tells us we have to be perfect, we have to be pure. So to me, that is one argument for purgatory because how many of us can say that when we die, we're already perfect, we're already perfectly pure. So purgatory, purgatory must exist for these things to be reality. Scripture also, as I've shown, has said that God will refine us and test us. And so in order for that to be true, there must be purgatory because most of us don't die purely refined. But I'm going to show even a few more examples of where Scripture shows us this idea of purgatory. And I'm going to read these passages because I think they're very important. I'll put them up there so you can read along. But this one is Matthew chapter 5, um, around verses 21 to 26, and there's a parallel verse in Luke 12. But Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. You have heard it said, and this is Jesus talking, You have heard it said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering a gift at the altar... And there you remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer, offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out to have paid the last penny. Now this last line is the key one. So you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus is telling us, initially starts out talking about different types of sin, and he emphasizes reconciliation. We must be reconciled with our brother, and this implies also with God. And then he tells us that the consequence is prison. Well, what does he mean by this prison? Is this prison heaven? Well, absolutely not. Heaven never would be referred to as a prison. Is this prison hell? Well, in hell, Jesus tells us elsewhere in Scripture, you can't escape from hell. Once you're in hell, you're in hell. You can't escape. So Jesus tells us there's a prison that's the consequence of sin where one can be freed from after the punishment has been paid. So after this last penny has been paid. So this suggests this idea of purgatory. And Father Gros Benedict Rochelle even says that when he's talking about when you bring your offering at the gift of the altar, he thinks he's referring to the altar in heaven. So when you come to heaven to make your gift of yourself at the altar, if you come with something on your soul still, you're still blemished and, and defiled, you must be reconciled, you must be made perfect. And this is that idea of this prison where you can be freed from after you've remitted all your punishment. Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35, this has a little similar type phrase. going to read it. And so what Jesus is starting out by saying, he clearly says, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. 
So Jesus tells us that he's comparing what he's about to say to the kingdom of heaven. And I'm not going to put the whole passage up there, but I'll, I'll read it. So therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And I might add, that's a very small amount compared to what he had owed the king. And so this servant seizes his, this man seizes his servant by the throat and says, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused, and he went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw this, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported this to the king, all that had taken place. Then the king summoned him and said, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. So again, this idea of you're going to be put in prison until you have paid the last debt. If there's anything that still remains, any type of attachment to the world or not fully have forgiven your brother. Now we can analyze the different sins Jesus is talking about, but I'm not going to spend time on that. I just want to focus on this idea of a prison existing where you can be freed from once your debt has paid, has been paid. And Jesus says, this is like the kingdom of heaven. So if this is like the kingdom of heaven, where is there a prison type situation where we can be freed from once we've paid our last debt? And so again, this is purgatory. Once we've paid the temporal punishment, that debt that we acquire because of our sins, once we've paid for that, we can be freed and we can enter heaven. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 15. And this one is really striking. And so if you think, you have to take the context. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and they're Christians, and they're believers. And so Paul is talking to them about sin, and he's going to tell them about their foundation being Jesus Christ. All right, so he says, for, for, Now if anyone builds on the foundation, meaning of Jesus Christ, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be, re it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire." So what happens to gold and silver and precious stones when they're burned? Well, if anything, they're purified, but they still remain. They still persist. They're not destroyed through fire. What happens to wood and straw and hay? Well, they're burned up. They're destroyed. And so what Paul is telling us is that our works, the things we do as believers, so our foundation has to be Christ, so we have to have a right relationship with God, and this is showing you must be in a state of grace because your foundation is Christ. And in that situation, when Christ is your foundation, everything you do, all the works you do in this life, are going to build up consequences, either gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, straw, and hay. And so you can take from this analogy that the gold, silver, and precious stones are those good things we do that build up the church, that build us, draw us closer to God. The wood, the straw, the hay are things that can be burned away. So those are our things that we do, our sinfulness, the, the worldly attachments we have. Those are the things that we cling to that aren't leading us towards God. And so what's going to happen is that we're going to be put through fire. And those things that aren't good, that aren't leading us to God, will be burned up. And so St. Paul says that at the last sentence, but if someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. So this process of being purified is 
something will, that will experience suffering. And then it, Paul says the person will be saved. So we can't be talking about hell because someone who goes to hell is not saved. They will not enter heaven. And so he says the person will be saved but only as through fire. And so he has to be talking about the fires of purgatory. The fires of purgatory that will purify us. That will burn away the wood, the straw, the hay. These impurities, these blemishes, the worldly things we're clinging to will be burned away so we can be made pure, perfect. And so Paul knows what Scripture says. Paul knows that Scripture says we must be perfect in our heaven. We must be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We must be holy as God is holy. We must be holy and blameless before the Lord. So Paul knows this. And so he recognizes that those who have a foundation of Christ but aren't perfect when they die need to pass through this fire to be saved, to enter heaven. So the next example is Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 to 32. And this one's a little bit more vague, but it still gives us a sense that there's something in the afterlife. So Jesus is talking, and he says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will not be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgi forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Now that last line is the one I want to focus on. Now blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is this idea if we reject God and we're, we persevere in this rejection, we die when we're just rejecting God and have, having nothing to do with Him, don't want to love Him, then we're going to go to hell. And I'm not going to focus on the rest of the passage other than saying that Jesus is emphasizing that this type of sin is something that cannot be forgiven in the age to come. It suggests that some things can be removed and restored and purified in the age to come. So it will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. And so again, there's this suggestion that Jesus is saying, this won't be forgiven in on earth, and this is not something that you will be go to heaven for, because purgatory is not something that can rid you of this type of a sin. Just, and he's like a mortal sin. Purgatory is not for those who die in a state of mortal sin. So this is a little bit more vague, but it does give this sense that Jesus is referring to this state of purgatory where some things can be forgiven and purities can be removed. The next one is Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to, 10, 9 to 11. And Paul is writing and he's talking about Jesus Christ and talking about what Jesus did for us. He came down and, and died on the cross for us. And then he continues, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that, the, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now again, the church doesn't really give us a clear definition of what this means, but I think there is some suggestion that we're talking about heaven, earth, and purgatory. And why? Well, because those souls in hell will not willingly bow their knee to Jesus. If they were to bow their, bow their knee to Jesus, it's only because they were forced to. The souls in hell have, do not want anything to do with Jesus. They hate Jesus. And so those in heaven would willingly bow at the name of Jesus. Those on earth who are Christian, who are united to Christ, would willingly bow at the name of Jesus. And then what about this are under the earth. We really don't know what Paul means, but we can definitely speculate that it could be purgatory, this other place where believers exist. Now, they're not literally under the earth, but it's just this um, expression of another state where people are that are not yet in heaven, but they're also not on earth. There's this other state where people who are Christian, united to Christ, who will bow what Jesus' name may be. So again, it's vague, and the church doesn't tell us that we have to believe that that's the interpretation of this, but it definitely gives us some suggestion that possibly Scripture could be referring to purgatory here. Now this one I, I, I like a lot. So this one's Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 25. And... Actually, whenever I've seen some non-Catholics read this passage, they'll say, well, I don't know what it means. It just doesn't make any sense. But as Catholics, you'll see that we can make perfect sense of it because of purgatory. But um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 25. 
And in this passage, the author of Hebrews is talking about a cloud of witnesses and he's talking about different people who are in heaven. He's also talked about that holiness that we talked about and the discipline that, that is required to be holy. And then he continues and he says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to a judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. And so the key is that we're in heaven. The author is talking about this vision of heaven. You have God and Jesus. You have the angels. You have saints. And then it says you have the spirits of just men made perfect. Well, what does this passage mean? And this is the line where a lot of non-Catholics don't understand it. But we see spirits. So spirits mean they're dead. They're people who are no longer alive on earth. So they've died. And then we see just men. So this means that they've died in godliness, in righteousness. They're in a right relationship with God. And then it says, made perfect. Now in the Greek, it can be translated as having been made perfect. Now, we don't know by this passage, do they arrive in heaven already made perfect? Or is this something that happens after death? It doesn't tell us, but it does tell us they've been made perfect. They're not simply covered by Christ and on the inside not really perfect. They just appear to be perfect. They've been made perfect at some point. Now, as I quote Father uh, or Monsignor Charles Pope, and then for myself, I know that if I were to die today, I wouldn't be perfectly pure. I wouldn't be having. I wouldn't have been made perfect yet in my life. So these spirits of these just men, they're in a right relationship with God. They've died, and they've been made perfect at some point. And so this can definitely give a sense of purgatory, because all those who die, not yet having been made perfect, will at some point be made perfect. And so we can take this passage to show it either happens in this life or it's going to happen after death. But at some point, those who are in heaven will have been made perfect. Now this is a passage that's not used often, but I think it gives us a, another sense of why purgatory is necessary. It's Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 6, verses 5 to 8. And in this, um, the prophet Isaiah had a vision, and he's taken up to heaven, and he sees the temple of God, and he sees God on a throne with the angels surrounding him. Now, Isaiah was a good man, but he recognized, just like all of us, he was sinful and unworthy. And so when he's taken up to heaven and he sees this, the, all these heavenly things, God on his throne and the angels around him, he cries out, "'Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips.'" And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he's saying, whoa, I'm looking at God, but I'm unpure, I'm unclean. And then immediately, Isaiah continues, Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And then I heard the voice of the say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And so this idea, so if in this passage, Isaiah is having this vision of heaven and he recognizes immediately he is not yet perfect and pure to be in this position. He needs to be made perfect in order to be in heaven, to be in the presence of God. And so what's interesting is the seraphim, and the seraphim mean like the fiery ones. So this seraphim can't even touch the coal, it's so hot. He uses tongs. So this coal is so hot that the seraphim has to take the tongs to take the coal, and then he touches Isaiah's lips with it. Now imagine if you take coal from your grill and put it to your lips, how painful that would be. So it shows this process of purification has to be painful to some degree, but it shows that this is essential to be in heaven, to be in the presence of God. We must be purified. We must be made clean, just like Isaiah shows us. Now the last one is from 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 39 to about 46. 
I'm going to set the stage a little bit for you. This is an Old Testament book. And Judas Maccabees and his men are in the midst of various battles. And they've had many victories. But they come to a battle where they're having a lot of difficulty. And they've been fighting for really, a really long time. And so Judas's men were very tired. So Judas prays to God and asks for help. And then we see that Scripture tells us that God gives them his help. And they become successful and the enemy flees. And the next thing we're told is that Judas and his army keep the Sabbath holy, so they honor the Sabbath. And then it continues after this point. It says, On the next day, as by that time it had become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and to bring them back to lie with their kinsmen and the sepulchres of their fathers. So they're going to collect those who have fallen and put them in the tombs. But then under the tunic of every, one of, their, of every one of their dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And they turned to prayer, beseeching that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. And then Judas also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering for those who had fallen. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and, fluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was holy and pious thought. Therefore he made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. And then the Latin Vulgate adds um, a line that's, It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosened from their sins. Now, this passage, when we're talking to people who aren't Catholic, we first have to keep in mind that they don't recognize this book in, in the Bible. And that's a talk for a whole other day. But this book, regardless... So as Catholics, this is an inspired book. It belongs in the Bible, and it's been that way for over... 1500 years, since around the 400s when scripture was said, Here's what, well, here are the 73 books in the Bible, and then the Jewish people recognized this book as well to a large degree. But even if you're not a Catholic and you don't have this in your scripture, in your Bible, this is still historical and it shows us the traditions of the Jewish people at that time right before Christ. And so it shows us that the Jewish people believed in praying for the dead. And it tells us me, I have a couple points. This is the, the key points of this passage. The men here, the Jewish men, pray for the dead so that the sin might be blotted out. They made a sin offering for the dead at Jerusalem in the temple. And then the scripture tells us in doing this, Judas and his men acted very well and honorably. And then it says, praying for those who fall asleep in godliness was a holy and pious thought. And so the key point, so why did they have these idols on their body? Weren't they not committing idolatry? Well, the answer is no, because they, it would not say they fell asleep in godliness had they, had they been worshiping these idols. What they were doing most likely is these were good luck charms, little superstitions. They still believed in God, but they had this little false idea and magic and superstitious things that they weren't really trusting in God and having faith in God. And so we can, we can take from this passage that it wasn't a mortal sin. Because it tells us they fell asleep in godliness, meaning right relationship with God. Idolatry would have totally made that a mortal sin. So they're in a right relationship with God, had these little idols, probably little superstitious trinkets um, on, their, on, their, on their bodies when they died. And so Judas and his men don't know the state of their soul. And so because of that, they pray. They pray for the dead. Now, why would you pray for the dead if you only believe that heaven and hell were the only two possibilities? Because if they're in hell, our prayers can't help them. If they're in heaven, they don't need our prayers. So there must be some state that exists after death that can, where the people can benefit from our prayer. And so the Jewish people believed in a state of purification after death. And this passage, this, the book of Maccabees, shows us that, that this existed among the Jewish people. And the other thing that's striking about this passage is it's not trying to teach us, oh, it's good to pray for the dead. No, it's just, it's a fact. They do it. There's no questioning when they pray for the dead. There's no one that kind of goes up in arms and saying, why, why are we doing this? It's just, it's a typical thing that's done. And so we can tell this is something that had already existed prior to this point.
among the Jewish people. And so this gives that sense that if you die in a state of grace, in a state of godliness, that our prayers can be beneficial because there's something that happens after death for some people and that's the idea of a process of purification.